Now, in this chapter for bonding, it's best to understand bonding along with structures. Because the way something exists, that means its structure is governed by its bonding. And the properties of structures are given because of certain bonding. Now, how do I categorize structure? So I want to focus on structure first, just to give you an intro and then take it from there. Because structure is what we think of uh, any substance, pure substance as. A pure substance could be an element or a compound. And structures can either be, I mean, there are only two types of structures, or there are two categories of structures. Either you can have giant structures, or you can have simple structures. Now, giant structures are actually of three types. You know all three from your previous education, IGCSE and O levels. Now, you uh, you can a giant can be either ionic, you know that's an ionic lattice. It's a giant ionic lattice. You can have metallic structures which are also giant, and you can have covalent giant structures which are called macromolecular. Macromolecular. These are basically giant covalent structures. And to give you examples, basically, ionic structures happen to be, let's say, solid NaCl, you know, even bricks like calcium carbonate, you know, cement blocks, stuff like that. Metallic structures are of only elements. They are of metals. Metals have metallic structure. Metals could be sodium itself, copper itself, aluminum, silver, gold, all of these guys have a metallic structure, which is, if you've studied this in O-levels and IGCSE, it's a lattice of cations surrounded by delocalized electrons. This fellow is basically a lattice of oppositely charged ions, meaning a sequence of positive negative ions in a square cube. And macromolecules, which ones have you seen, or you have at least seen the structure of, uh, one is considered to be diamond, there is silica also, um, silica, there's also graphite, um, there's also things called graphene, which we'll discuss later, but I'm giving you names first, what you're familiar with from IGCSE and O-levels. You got ionic compounds that have an ionic structure, which is a giant structure. So the bonding is ionic, the structure is diamond. Again, at this stage, we all know these terms, giant, simple, covalent, ionic, metallic, because you would have to graduate IGCSE and O-levels to be here, right? If you didn't, you're in the wrong class. But I'm assuming you have, so you've heard these terms before. Macromolecules are giant covalent molecules, which have, you know, long, strong bonds. Now, one thing is common to all of them. The reason why they're called giant is because they seem to have never-ending structures. They're held by strong bonds, and they, what we call, are found as, uh, uh, at room temperature as solids. You know, they have what we call high melting and boiling points. That's one thing that's common to all. So all giants have high melting points on giant structures. A good way to tell what's a simple structure, simple structure has low melting points and boiling points. Generally, these happen to be gases, you know, and some can be liquids also, liquids and gases mainly, while these guys at room temperature are solids. And these guys have generally have high melting point. There are some metals which have low melting point, and that, those are exceptions. Things like mercury, things like group one metals, which are not as high as everybody else, but we still call them giant structures. On the other hand, simple structures are, have low melting and boiling point. And the reason why we call them giant or simple is because of their properties. You know, so if you know a substance properties, you can de deduce its structure. So if something has a high melting point, it must be one of these three structures. If something has a low melting point, it has to be a simple structure. What, what do you call a simple structure? Another name for a simple structure, there's only one type. Those are simple covalent molecules or a simple molecular structure. Molecular structure. Yes, you also have monoatomic structures like, you know, noble gases that have absolutely no bonding, like helium, argon, and stuff like that. So neither have they 
bonded covalently, neither they have ionic bonds. They're just simple structures. So they are simple molecular structures. Some of them can don't have to have covalent bonding. Those happen to be monoatomic, like hydrogen helium. But the rest of them, things like oxygen gas, or um, you know, HCl, or even glucose, C6H12O6, is considered, you know, this is glucose, a simple molecular structure. On the other end, polymers are considered to be macromolecular. So, and their properties will help us determine their type of structure. So. Low melting point, point is this, high is this. Now, then how would you differentiate among the three? Again, this is a recap of properties you might remember from O-levels in IGCSE. For example, if a substance conducts current in the solid state, it can only be one thing. What can it be? If a something conducts current in the solid state, it can only be a metal, you know? Because none of the other guys conduct current in the solid state, except for one particular macromolecule that happens to be graphite. That's the only one. Then, those substances that do not conduct current in the solid state, but conduct current in a liquid state, or aqueous state, especially liquid state, those are ionic compounds. So, if you conduct current in the solid state and you have a high melting point, you're a metal. If you have a high melting point and you conduct current only in the liquid state, you are an ionic compound. But if you have a high melting point and now you don't conduct current in the solid state, which is, that means you're not a metal, and you don't conduct current in the uh, liquid state, you don't conduct current ever, you are going to be a macromolecule, except for graphite, but everything else will be a macromolecule. And anything that has a low melting point tends to be a simple molecular structure. You know, even 100 degrees for water makes it a simple molecular structure, meaning the melting, boiling point of water. These guys have large melting points, all right? So this introduces you to the idea of structures. Now let's talk about substances and the kind of bonding they have. So now let's do another classification. We talked about substructures, let's talk about substances. So if I take the set of all pure substances, pure substances can either be one of two things. They can either be elements, or they can be compounds. That's what they can be. Elements or compounds. Yeah. And uh, we can subdivide this into two categories and this into two categories, generally speaking. Now, elements can be divided into uh, two categories, which are metals, right? So let me just scroll here just a little bit. So I might need some space here. So metals and we call them non-metals. Yeah. And obviously if you're metals, you have a certain bonding and structure. And if you're non-metal, you'll have some, a certain other structures. But compounds on the other hand have very, sub very I mean, let's, let's, let's finish this first and then get back to these guys. So compounds can be divided into either, they can only be an ionic compound or you could be a covalent compound. Now, if you're an ionic compound, then you could either be, I mean, there's only one structure then. If you're an ionic compound, you only can be found as a, what do you call it? A giant ionic lattice. So ionic bonding is only found, found in compounds. That's it, not in elements. And if you're ionic, your structure is giant ionic lattice. We've seen some examples of that already. On the other hand, if you're covalent, you can have, if you're covalent molecule, you can have two different structures. You can have a simple structure, or you can have what we call a giant structure. Giant is also known as macromolecular. So I'll scroll here for a second and get some space here. So simple molecular, so simple molecular and giant molecular. Now giant molecular are also known as macromolecular. Simple molecular are which ones? Simple molecular could be HCl, I mean two elements. It could also be three elements like HClO. It could be, uh, you know, a gas like SO3. 
it could even be a solid like or sorry liquid sorry like octane which is c8h18 you know on the other hand the giant molecular structures which are covalently bonded compounds the one that we really study is sio2 you know that's a like a diamond there are more obviously but that's the one we study right now the unique thing about covalent structures is that they can be found in compounds and they can be found in elements. So when I go on to the element side, I want to talk about a little more details. So maybe if I can just squeeze this guy over and get some space back. So yeah, maybe like that, you know. So metals can only be of one kind. They have a metallic bonding and metallic structure. Metallic bonding and they have a metallic structure. On the other hand, co non metals can be two types, I mean, two broad categories. One broad category is monoatomic, meaning they are, don't make bonds, they have no covalent characteristics in them. They are what we call simple structures, you know, but they don't make covalent bonds. So they are, you can even call them simple molecules, but they don't have any bonding. So there's no covalent bonding in them no bonding whatsoever they happen to be like helium and neon argon they will have what we call intermolecular forces and those forces you will realize exist only in simple covalent structures and we'll do you've probably heard of them in your o level igcsc they're called van der waals forces and we'll look at them in more detail in a levels just very soon but those are the only forces that exist in monoatomic molecules. Helium, neon, argon, they have no covalent bonding. But between multiple atoms of these guys, they will be van der Waals. Okay? Now, if you're not monoatomic, then you can also be uh, what we call molecular, covalently molecular. Now, molecular means making covalent bonds, which means these guys have covalent bonding. That's what's here. So metallic bonding, no covalent bonding, covalent bonding, ionic bonding, covalent bonding. So metals, you can mean no covalent bonds or how can have covalent bonding. But because they have covalent bonding, there can be two types of covalent bonding. They can be simple and macromolecular, which is also giant. Stuff like silicon, carbon, which is diamond, you know, diamond silicon graphite and simple could be like o2 n2 you know even p4 is simple this sulfur s8 these guys are all elements where there's more than one atom combined they don't always have to be diatomic they are sometimes but they don't always have to be diatomic now these guys these simple molecules that are covalently bonded are the only type that have more than one type of bonding. For example, what I mean, in metals, you only have metallic bonding. In uh, ionic compounds, you only have ionic bonding. In macromolecules, you only have covalent bonding. But in simple molecules like these fellows, and I'll just maybe even highlight them. So simple covalently bonded molecules like here and in the compounds, both, both in elements and compounds. This particular simple molecular structure they don't only have covalent bonding between atoms in the molecule. Multiple molecules also attract each other and those are your intermolecular forces. In all of those IGCSE, you call them van der Waals. We'll look at them in more detail now, soon. But they have that. And so substances like uh, oxygen and nitrogen, they have covalent bonding and they have van der Waals forces. Multiple attractions, while the rest of them either uh, are only one attraction apiece, ionic, metallic, or covalent and macromolecules. But simple guys have multiple layers, which is why their properties are different, which is why they have low melting and boiling points, is because they have those weak intermolecular forces. Yeah. So now that we have seen these structures and how the division happens, we are gonna be first focusing on bonding before we move on to structure. So First, you realize that when you are compounds, there's only two kinds of bonding, ionic 
and covalent and i want to understand i want to actually get you to understand how these are how does it get decided that an element or a compound is either ionic or covalent it isn't as simple as what you will learn in o levels in igcsc that oh metals and non metals become ionic and non metals form covalent bonds it's true not always though because it's not to do with metal non metal as much as to do with another property so let's take a look at that now before i go on to what determines the kind of bonding i've got to also just for a minute just make sure that you guys remember which are the metals versus which are the non metal non metals in the periodic table so here is a division between the metals in the periodic table and the non metals the blue colored ones are metals and the pink ones are non metals groups 1 to the transition elements and then some group 3 group 4 and 5 are metals and groups these guys just group 7 and group 6 and a bit of group 5 and noble gases are non metals and because these ones in green will conduct current in the solid state and these non metals generally don't conduct current in the solid state they just exist in the gaseous or liquid states mostly and some solids now this division is not what determines ionic and covalent generally it would help us you know generally we see if the metal combines with non metal generally there are ionic compounds but but i'll tell you a compound that should be ionic it isn't and there are few like that there's a compound called alcl3 this fellow is made up of a metal and a non metal this is aluminum right here by the way which is a metal and chlorine is a non metal right here and that is covalent and then you might say well then makes maybe aluminum makes covalent compounds only but that's not true it's alf3 is ionic which is aluminum with fluorine so fluorines here and chlorines here and aluminum there and with one non metal it makes covalent and the other non metal it makes ionic in fact you know the guy below it will also be covalent so there is some other property that basically is changing as you go from fluorine chlorine to bromine which is why aluminum with these guys is covalent while the guy at the top it's ionic you know and let's talk about that now and what does that property it's called electronegativity electronegativity and it has a particular trend across a period and down a group so let's talk about that the term i just mentioned is called electronegativity in a way it is the power of an element to attract electrons and basically every atom has this ability to attract or pull electrons but it varies from element to element what i will tell you as a trend first and then explain the trend and what it even means together is that first i'll tell you that this idea of electronegativity this power of an element is going it increases across a period and it increases up a group okay it's mainly kept for basically groups 1 to 17 not even noble gases because noble gases don't bond so it doesn't really matter it's a property left from groups 1 to 17 and across a period the property increases in value and down a group it decreases which means up a group it increases now what is this value property its ability to pull electrons and you might wonder well hey this is the exact same trend we see for first ionization energies and the reason why the trend is the same is because the factors that affect ionization energy have the same effect on electronegativity because across a period nuclear charge increases so it becomes harder to lose electrons but it should become stronger to pull in electrons down a group ionization energy decreases so does electronegativity 
because down a group, it's not as hard, not as easy to pull electrons because they're easier to lose because there's more shielding and more distance. So the same factors that make ionization energy low also make electronegativity low. So across a period, electronegativity increases just like across a period, ionization energy increases. And down a group, electronegativity decreases just like ionization energy decreases. And so if things are bonded to each other, electronegativity plays a role in saying, telling you which will pull electrons more towards themselves. So if I look at just this trend, you know, you got nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine on top. Now, the, it's simply the idea is that amongst these elements, fluorine is the one that's going to pull the electrons the most towards itself. And remember, non uh, these guys are metals, like which ones? Lithium, sodium, potassium. They have very low ionization energies. This, these guys have low ionization energies, which means it doesn't require much energy to lose the electrons. At the same time, they have low electronegativity, meaning they have no desire to gain electrons, which is why groups one and groups two, you learned in O-levels and IGCSE, is that they lose electrons. While these guys are high on the electronegativity scale, so they want to gain electrons, which is why we say in O-levels, metals lose and non-metals gain. Metals lose because their ionization energy is low. Non-metals gain because their electronegativity is high. For losing, it's easier if it's less energy required to lose it. And electronegativity is a power. It goes increases across a period that they're going to pull the electrons in more. And this trend will help us understand why sodium and fluorine makes ionic. Because this guy in needing its electron as much. It can easily lose electrons because of low ionization energy. While fluorine is highly electronegative, we say. That means it really wants electrons. So not much energy required to lose electrons, really wants electrons. So electrons go from here to here. And when the ability to lose electrons and gain electrons becomes closer, where there's, that it becomes harder to lose and even harder to gain, that's when they start sharing. Hence, that's what covalent bonding is. Covalent bonding was that, hey, we really, none of us really can truly lose an electron, so let's just share an electron. Now, it makes it easier for us to determine if we knew the values for electronegativity. So there are values for it, but it's man-made scales. So there are relative values designed by some men. We use one particular such scale. So it's not an actual value, it's not energy required, so we can't measure it. It's just somebody's values, and I'll give that to you right now. So there is a scale out of four. Now don't ask me why it's out of four. I'm supposed to know just for general knowledge, and I don't know. So there's a scale called the Pauling's scale. Pauling's scale. It's a scale to measure something's electronegativity. In that case, you'll notice we ignore the noble gases. This is the whole PR table. The elements and their electronegativities are written below them. They are some as low as 0.7. They go to 1, 2.2, .2, 3, whatever. And the highest is 4. So the highest value is 4.0. And the lowest value is 0 0.7. And the noble gases are the ones that since they do not share electrons, they don't want electrons, their values are not measured. So this is all I care about. Now, you don't need to learn these values, but these values will help us determine what kind of bondings exist. You know, it's because of this scale. Now, it's because if two things have similar electronegativities, let's say 3.4, like 3 and 3.4, their, their electronegativities are very similar. That's why when nitrogen and oxygen bond, they become covalent. When the differences are large, let's say potassium and oxygen, 0.8 and 3, that's a large difference. They will be ionic. And there's a, there's, a, there's a back of the hand kind of rule that helps us determine which electronegativity difference will result in ionic bonding and which will result in covalent bonding. Now, I'm going to scroll down to show you a much more simplified 
uh, and as an electronegativity table. Now, why is it simplified? It only has group ones, group twos, some group threes, and group 17, because that's the one we want to worry about. You know, you got group 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, the halogens. Now, here, I gotta talk about why some of these are ionic while others are covalent. Yep. Now, if you notice, remember I told you that ALF3 is ionic. So ALF3 is ionic. Now to make, to figure that out, what's the difference in electronegativities of AL and F3? That's how we determine it. It's all about the difference in electronegativities. So what's the electronegativity of F? F is four. While aluminum, so I'm gonna highlight F. While aluminum is how much? 1.5. That's a difference of 2.5. That is a difference we consider to be ionic. All right? 4 and 1.5 is 2.5. Now, why is it ionic? Because the difference is less, is greater than 1.8. That's the key, 1.8. Now, if I look at ALCL3, what's ALCL3's difference? Aluminum and chlorine. That's 3 minus 1.5. That difference is only 1.5. Because of that, it is covalent. So that's how you determine ionic versus covalent. Look at aluminum and bromine. 2.8 minus 1.5. That's 1.3. So if it's less than 1.8, it's covalent. If it's more than 1.8, it is ionic. And that's how it is worked out, always. Now, if it is, yeah, 1.8 is somewhere on the borderline, I get it, but you know, that's the general rule of thumb, it's not always exact, it's like, understand that there is a variation of bonding, you know, it's not as straightforward as ionic or covalent, because if I tell you that, think about H and H molecule, what kind of bonding will they have? They'll have covalent, because their difference will be how much B? So their difference in electronegativity would be how much? It'll be 2.1 minus 2.1, zero. That's what we call purely covalent, okay? And if I say I have NaCl, now how much difference does NaCl have? NaCl is three minus 0.9. And that difference is three minus 0.9. That's 2.1. What is that? That is ionic. And HCl, let's get HCl in the middle. Now what's HCl's difference? HCl is Cl is 3 and H is 2.1. How much is that? That is 0 0.9. So it is definitely not ionic, it's covalent, but we call it polar covalent because it's not neutral completely because chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen. So it's not ionic, but it's polar covalent. What that means is that chlorine has a slight negative charge. While in NaCl, chlorine had a full negative charge because there was a transfer of electrons. When they're covalently bonded, there is a fight with the electrons. And we'll look at co polar bonds later in more detail. But just to give an overview right now, polarity is in covalent bonds when the electronegativity is different then the guy that's more negative has a partial negative charge. The same thing would happen in water. This is why HCl, by the way, if you remember, in water ionizes. And the only way it can ionize is because it is, H is slightly positive and Cl is slightly negative. And it's not just here. I mean, when we did this, this electronegative difference is not 1.8 or more. So it's not ionic, it's covalent, but between the two of them, Al and Cl, Cl is more electronegative than Al. So if you ever were to see the bonding for AlCl3, you know, it'll be covalent like these sticks and the chlorines would be having a partial negative charge. Instead of three plus and one minus, which is what AlF3 is. AlF3 is ionic, so it is three plus and one minus. But when it comes to covalent, and there's a difference in negativity. 
it's polar covalent okay and this guy that's purely covalent because it doesn't have these uh, polarities it's called non-polar and obviously you can only determine you can only have polar covalent when there's a covalent bond and when you have the same element like H H O O N N they will be non-polar and noble gases since they don't make covalent bonds can never be polar covalent okay and since no element has the same electronegativity as something else generally I mean you have metals that have the same but non-metals kind of are different like how N and Cl don't seem to have a difference in electronegativity so they might not be as polar okay but these values are also flawed like even these values are not true true best values because even though N and Cl are the same value N is more electronegative than Cl these guys are the three most electronegative elements you know and the reason why that matters is because N is smaller than Cl so smaller size helps in pulling the electrons more because there's less shielding so, so there's technically speaking, when you have two different elements, you're going to have polarity. Either it'll be ionic completely or partially like this. And so we are definitely going to take a look at this more. But what does polarity really mean? Let me just give you wrap this up with one idea. So when you said that NaCl makes completely ionic, the reason why it's ionic is because chlorine has taken nah, sodium's electron like the cross let's say sodiums and chlorine had its own a uh, seven electrons and when hydrogen and hydrogen make a bond they share each other's electrons equally but the guy in the middle that is HCl is polar because the electrons are still shared but they're shared more towards H uh, so towards Cl than H that's why Cl gets a negative charge because Cl is more electronegative and what does it truly mean to be more electronegative? That you pull the electrons more towards yourself than the other guy. So ionic, purely covalent, polar covalent. Yeah. So the electrons are moved, they are drawn closer to Cl. If Cl was even more electronegative, then this would have happened. Or when the difference was more, then Cl will pull it enough so it becomes here. So it's like this. You know, they're equally shared. Then if it's slightly polar, they move to one guy. When it's completely polar, uh, when it's ionic, they have completely moved away to one guy and there's no stick left in between. You know, that's the idea. You know, like A and A will share equally, while A and B, B it might be more closer towards B. Like, uh, maybe like that. But if it's ionic, let's say A and E, then E has gained the electron and gets an overall negative charge versus here and here. Nonpolar, polar covalent, ionic. It's a gradi gradient uh, of moving towards one guy. When it completely moves it, that's what we call transfer. That's what happens between uh, groups 1 and group 17. Because the difference is so large, E can really pull it away from A, you know. Because E, yeah, that's what it is. All right. Hey there, if you like what you saw right now, head over to altacademy.org for access to content around six subjects with past papers, videos, revision guides, flashcards, and academic support. All of this is going to make sure that you're completely set for your A-levels. So I'll see you there on the platform.